1954, I found myself at the heart of war. President Putin has announced what he calls a special military operation. As journalists, we will never truly understand what it feels like to have your home destroyed. But the next best thing is for us to find those people and bear witness to what they have gone through. There are endless moments when this war feels pointless, and this is one of them. There are so many human tales of survival and recovery. An undeniable moment, President Zelensky appearing in the heart of her son. Many predicted Russian troops would be wandering Kyiv within days. Ukraine's defense has been both surprising and extraordinary. Sadly, this war is still happening, and we will continue to tell the story of the conflict in Ukraine. Live from Washington, this is BBC News. A dramatic day in Russia, from rebellion to retreat after Wagner's boss goes rogue. We'll have the latest. And it has been one year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, sparking protests across the country. I'm Helena Humphrey, glad you could join me. We start with what has been an extraordinary 24 hours in Russia. The head of the Wagner mercenary group, Evgeny Prigozhin, has left for Belarus, and Prigozhin told his forces to return to their bases earlier to avoid bloodshed after negotiations with Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko to end their rebellion against the Russian Defense Ministry. Now, Wagner fighters have been leaving the southern city of Rostov-on-Don. That's according to reports, and security had been tightened in Moscow with the mayor telling residents to avoid travelling. Now, all mass outdoor events have been cancelled until the 1st of July. But Russia's TASS news agency is now reporting that all restrictions previously imposed on Russia's motorways have now been lifted. Well, here you can see Wagner leader, the Wagner leader departing for uh, Russia for Belarus earlier following the announcement to cancel that rebellion. And prior to that announcement, a huge convoy had been heading towards Moscow in what Vladimir Putin had described as an attempted mutiny. Now, charges against Prigozhin and his Wagner forces will be dropped. President Putin's press secretary said that Wagner mercenaries who wish to sign a Ministry of Defence contract can, and that fighters who took part in the uprising will not be prosecuted. <laughs> Well, meanwhile, these are the latest images of locals chanting Wagner as the troops from the mercenary group were leaving Rostov. And here you can see tanks boarding trucks leaving the area. And earlier, in an audio message posted on Telegram, Prigozhin said that the time had come to stand down. They wanted to disband the Wagner. On June 23rd, we went out on a justice march. Within a day, we were just 200 kilometers away from Moscow. During that time, we did not spill a single drop of blood of our fighters. Now the moment has come when the blood can be spilled. Therefore, understanding all the responsibility for the fact that Russian blood will be spilled on one of the sides, we are turning our columns back and leaving in the opposite direction to the field camps according to the plan. Well, let's look back now at the past 24 hours. So early Friday, Prigozhin questioned the war in Ukraine, blaming Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, claiming that he did it to gain military honors. Prigozhin called for an armed rebellion, vowing to march for justice and accused the Kremlin of hitting his troops with a missile strike on Friday. Now, in Moscow, security has stepped up as Wagner takes Rostov-on-Don. And on Saturday, Prigozhin declared that 25,000 of his troops crossed the border from Ukraine in the early hours of the morning. A video appeared online showing Prigozhin inside Russia's southern military headquarters. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin denounced the, quote, criminal adventure. He warned of punishments in a TV address. And over the course of the day, Wagner forces made progress up the M4 motorway towards Moscow, seizing military facilities in Voronezh. Now, just hours ago, Prigozhin said that he had agreed to stop the movement of his troops, turning them around from their route towards Moscow. Belarus revealed that its leader, Alexander Lukashenko, had been holding talks with Prigozhin and Putin, and Putin had agreed to it. Now, Russian state media reports that Prigozhin will leave Belarus and that criminal leave, excuse me, for Belarus, and that criminal charges against him and his troops will be dropped. Well, for more analysis on what all of this means, I'm joined here in the studio by Barbara Starr, former Pentagon correspondent at CNN, also a senior fellow at the USC Annenberg Center in California. Barbara, it's been great having your analysis um, on the program. Prigozhin, of course, as we know, reportedly headed to Belarus. Is that is this it for this open feud with the defense ministry? I know it's a huge question, but where could this potentially go? Yeah, does it, you know, the question, does anybody think Bergosian's going to quietly go into retirement and live happily into old age? Uh, people who challenge Russian leadership, that does not often happen to them. So that will be one thing to watch. What will happen to the Wagner Group? They have some 50,000 fighters inside Ukraine, according to the British MOD at one point. And, and the big question perhaps right now is what about Putin? How damaged is he? Is his position weaker? Will he lash out? And the Russian military high command, uh, the defense minister Shoigu, the chief of staff Gerasimov, these are guys that Putin had not been, uh, that he had been estranged from them in, from them in recent days. Uh, perhaps the one thing he had in common with Prigozhin is neither of them liked the way the war was being prosecuted at some point. And it was a few days ago that the U.S. intelligence community began to see the signs of this, that Prigozhin might have been stockpiling ammunition, weapons. What was he going to do with all of that? That's still a big question. Did he really think he was going to get to Moscow and depose Putin? It seems extraordinarily unlikely. So what happened here and what's going to happen now? and very few people know the answer. Huge question marks, as you say, Barbara, right now. In light of these remarkable events, what kind of conversations do you think that the US administration is having behind closed doors right now? Well, I think they're probably trying to figure out topic number one, what happens with Putin now? Will he remain in power? Will he remain in power as strong as he is right now? Is his, uh, is his position damaged? Will that emerge, if it is, does that emerge right away or does it sort of chip away over time? And if there is that kind of instability in Russia, further instability, what does that mean? What does it mean for uh, the Russian military? What does it mean for the war in Ukraine? What does it mean for NATO's eastern flank that butts up against uh, Russia and Ukraine? Because, you know, it's one thing the intelligence community needs to gather as much information as it can, learn more they know that's their job. For the U.S. military and for the military services in Europe along that eastern flank, what they don't like is uncertainty. They want to know what they need to be prepared for. And right now, they just can't be sure. Well, on that point, you know, about uncertainty, do you think there'll also be a conversation here about being a little bit caught out? Are there any indications that U.S. officials were slightly surprised right. by this? I think that they there are indications they knew, but they didn't know exactly. So was it knowable, if you will, that what Prigozhin was going to do and how Putin might react and that Lukashenko would be brought into all of this? This became a very complicated mix of developments with just within several hours. So was that even knowable? And they will have to go back and look at that. Will we ever find out the answer? Hmm, maybe not. But, but they will need to go back and figure out what they heard, what they saw, what intelligence they had, and what it really all added up to. And did they miss any signs so they don't miss them next time? Exactly. Barbara Starr, former Pentagon correspondent at CNN, also a senior fellow at the USC Annenberg Center in California. Really great having you with us Thanks. tonight. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you. All right, I want to take a closer look now at the man who called for the rebellion, Yevgeny Prigozhin, of course, and the group of mercenary soldiers that he leads, known as the Wagner Group. Our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, has more details now. 
Evgeny Prigozhin, outside Russian military headquarters in Rostov-on-Don this morning, boasting his Wagner group have taken it without firing a shot. But just who is this man challenging Russia's leaders? Prigozhin began as a criminal from St. Petersburg. After leaving jail, he began selling hot dogs, but then graduated to running expensive restaurants. He caught the attention of Russia's leader, leading him to be known as Putin's chef. He catered to world leaders when they visited, even America's president, but also became rich from lucrative military contracts. About a decade ago, he began to carry out operations around the world on behalf of the Kremlin, even interfering in America's 2016 election. But Prigozhin became best known as head of Wagner, an often brutal private mercenary group working to the Kremlin's agenda. It's been operating across the Middle East and Africa, including Syria, Libya and Mali, allowing Putin to project power without being directly involved. But it's in the last year in Ukraine that it's really come to the fore. As Putin's plans for a quick victory faded, Prigozhin's forces undertook some of the heaviest fighting. Some of them came from prisons. Here's Prigozhin recruiting them in return for an early release. Laying flowers on the graves of those who died helped him cultivate an image in Russia as a nationalist hero, one who would fight harder in Ukraine. But battles like in Bakhmut led to growing tension between Prigozhin and the regular Russian military leadership. He angrily accused its leaders, like Defence Minister Shoigu and Military Chief Gerasimov, of using his men as cannon fodder and denying them vital supplies. Prigozhin claimed Russia's soldiers had been let down by their leaders, and his attacks on them became increasingly outspoken. It was clear one side or other would have to move, bringing what had been a simmering crisis to the boil. Well, in the last hour, I spoke about uh, the conflict in Russia with William Taylor, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Is Putin still in trouble? He's certainly diminished, Helena. Uh, he's certainly diminished. Uh, both sides, both Putin and Prigozhin, um, made statements that indicated that they were up for a fight. Um, you, you've reported both of those. Uh, Putin said this is treason and he's going to crush them. Um, and Prigozhin said uh, uh, that all, the, all what the Ministry of Defense was doing was, uh, was killing Russians and that there was no reason for, the, for, the, for Putin's invasion in the first place. So they were, uh, they, they were both staking out strong positions and they both backed down. They both backed down uh, today. Um, uh, they neither wanted to have the real fight, it looks like. And so the compromise is what we saw here today. I'm wondering, though, even if they did appear to back down, about the optics and what that may, might lead to in this. Because, you know, you said that the Russians are supposed to be fighting the Ukrainians and, and they might be distracted. Those soldiers might even run. What do you think that these latest developments, these latest optics now mean for Putin's army? I think Putin's army has been shaken. Um, they've been shaken by this uh, mutiny, uh, by one of their best forces, one of their best units. The Bogosian Wagner group uh, was one of the toughest ones. They did, they did grinding work, but they did effective work of uh, Bakhmut, as we know. Um, and they were pulled off the line. Uh, Prigozhin pulled the Wagner out of the line in Ukraine to, to march north towards Moscow, as you said. Uh, it sounds like they might be going back to the south. They haven't gone back into Ukraine yet. So all to say that the Russian forces now are still weaker today than they were two days ago. The Russian forces in Ukraine trying to defend what that long line of, uh, of like 600, mi 600 miles, uh, 900 kilometers, that's a long line for them to defend and they've got fewer people to do it. And their morale is lower because they've seen this chaos in the Kremlin. So all I right, think so this... Sorry, Ambassador, but with all of this in mind, potentially diminished morale, the fact that these troops haven't yet gone back what could this essentially mean on the battlefield for Ukraine? How can they 
take this moment to capitalize? And also, do they have what they need to do so? We will see if they have what they need to do so. Um, if they succeed, that is, if they break through the line um, and they they then exploit that breakthrough uh, in the Russian rear, uh, then they will have then we'll know that they will have had what they needed. Um, we should give them more. We should be sure that they have everything that they need. But you asked, you know, what is their opportunity? Yes, there is an opportunity now. The, the Russians, as we just said, are weaker. Um, they are demoralized. The Ukrainians are emboldened. The Ukrainians are pleased that their enemy um, is in disarray. And the Ukrainians have been looking for weaknesses up and down the line. They've been preparing their new brigades, um, newly equipped, newly trained, um, ready to go. Those are, are just the timing is actually very good for the Ukrainians because they're prepared even before this craziness of the last day. The Ukrainians were mounting, were about to mount, about to commit uh, their main forces into this counteroffensive. So they are in a good position to exploit. So how long do you think then until we see some potential successes, some potential gains? I would say weeks, Helena. I would say weeks. I would say um, this certainly this summer we will see that those potential gains. And what about for Putin? He said to these Wagner troops that there won't necessarily be punishment or repercussions. He's also uh, asked for them to sign up to be with his forces. We just don't know how that's going to play out right now. Ultimately, though, do you think that Putin can succeed on the battlefield without those Wagner troops? Over the long term, he probably can. Um, there are a lot of Russians. There are 140 million Russians. He has a lot of Russians to pull into a draft and bring it, but it'll take him time. It'll take him a long time to, to round them up. It'll take a long time to train them. It'll a long time to equip them. They've lost a lot of equipment in these battles. So, so Putin, yes, over the long term, can regenerate those forces. So that's why the Ukrainians need, and they know they need, to move now. If you're talking about regenerating those forces, essentially, what does this mean then for people still in Russia right now? Does this mean more draconian laws, drafts, further crackdowns? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. People say that the crackdown so far is as bad as, as people can, can remember. In, in living memory. That is the, the oppression right now, the control uh, that Putin has over the country is, is, is firmer now, is, is harsher now than it was during Soviet times. Um, and and it will, as you say, it will only get worse. If he, has to, if he has to institute the draft again, another mobilization, a larger mobilization than last time, even last time he had a hard time getting his 300,000 and more than a million left the country. So he's got problems, but he can do that. There is a, there is a large pool of Russians that he can, they can draft into his army over time. It's going to take him time. Well, Ambassador, if we contemplate just for a moment a Russia without Putin, what do you think that could mean for the country? Could that lead to some kind of political vacuum? And what could we see then bubble up? Yes, after Putin, um, it could get worse or it could go into chaos, as you said. It's unlikely to get better, um, but it could get worse. So the chaos could, uh, could be the, the, the scenario for a while. Probably if Putin were to leave one way or the other, the prime minister, Dushin, would would take over. Not a strong leader, and there would continue to be jockeying and pushing. We remember what happened when Stalin died. You know, this is the... Uh, this is, you know, likely what would what would happen. So it would be a difficult time, uh, time of troubles for the Russians. Uh, but here again, um, the Ukrainians would have had an opportunity, a great opportunity, um, to force then to the to the negotiating table to push the Russians mm -hmm. out of Ukraine in that scenario and force the new government to negotiate. We want to bring you a new development now. Our colleagues at BBC Russian are reporting uh, that an explosion has been heard in the southeast Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. That's according to the public broadcaster in Ukraine. Now, an air raid alert has apparently been declared in the city 
and the region. A reminder for you that Zaporizhia is the site of the largest nuclear power plant in Europe that was captured by the Russians last May after fierce fighting. And this news comes after Ukraine's President Zelensky accused Russia of plotting a terror attack on the plant. This is uh, something that Moscow denies. Well, remember, for more information on everything happening in Russia right now, do head to the BBC News website, the app as well. That is where our team is tracking every development, full background analysis and, of course, the latest BBC reporting. Well, turning to some other news now, and it has been a year since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling, which had given women the constitutional right to an abortion. Today, across the United States, activists have been marching to mark the day. Now, as demonstrators uh, marched against the ruling in Washington across the country, anti-abortion rallies have also taken place to mark the day. Well, for more on what's happening on the anniversary of the Roe v. Wade overturning North America correspondent Sophie Long reports. Legal abortion and As news broke of the Supreme Court's ruling, protests erupted across America. Abortion became illegal automatically in some states. In others, bans were swiftly signed into effect and clinics closed. Mississippi's last abortion provider is now a furniture shop. But those who worked here are still performing the procedure two states and 17 hours drive away in New Mexico. We moved everything from Jackson here and we opened the facility here for women. Um, mostly, we mostly serve Texas women here. I think it's a great loss for the women in Mississippi. I think it's a, um, <laughs> I think it ha they have taken it just like they have everything else in Mississippi and they've taken Mississippi backwards. In Mississippi, everything has changed and nothing has changed. In the poorest parts of America's poorest state, for some, accessing an abortion was almost impossible before the ban. Often the only support available is at crisis pregnancy centers run by anti-abortion organizations. I understand single parenthood. I understand not knowing if food will be there. I understand the lack of resources. I understand what a lot of these women are going through. I understand um, infertility. I understand the decision of do I abort, do I keep. I understand a lot of things that maybe when you look at women like me or, or others that run facilities like this that we don't understand, but we, we do. Over the past 12 months, the United States has become a confusing patchwork of abortion laws. In Texas, where I am now, it's illegal. But just across the border in New Mexico, women still have the right to choose. And so doctors like Aaron Campbell travel thousands of miles every week to perform the procedure legally. I'm not in my own clinic because we had to close. It's a felony in Tennessee to provide abortion. I believe in this right for people to be able to make this decision for themselves. And I believe that they should be able to get that care from someone who knows how to do this safely. Meanwhile, in Mississippi, even though terminating an unwanted pregnancy is now illegal, anti-abortion activists continue their campaign. The abortion pill, the poison pill in Mississippi, we know that it can be sent through the mail or across the border. So we're, you know, we're concerned about women still obtaining unsafe abortions without the proper medical care. And then also women can still go across state lines. Last year, an important battle may have been won by the anti-abortion lobby. But the fight over reproductive rights in America continues with no end in sight. Sophie Long, BBC News, Mississippi. Investigators in Canada have boarded the support ship used to launch the Titan submersible, which was destroyed during a deep dive to the wreck of the Titanic last week. All five people on board were killed. Now, the ship, the Polar Prince, returned to port in Newfoundland, where police and safety inspectors had gone to gather information and carry out interviews. The U.S. Coast Guard will also be involved in the investigation. The ship had its flag at half-mast, and it was towing four white buoyancy tanks used to launch the doomed submersible. BBC's Nomi Iqbal is in Newfoundland. The Polar Prince made its long journey home, nearly a week since it left for the high seas. 
A flag flew at half-mast out of respect for the five men who died. These are among the last known pictures of the submersible. The Polar Prince launched it into the Atlantic last Sunday, but contact was lost an hour and 45 minutes later. They notified the Coast Guard after more than four hours. Following an international search lasting days, parts of the sub were eventually found on the seabed near the Titanic wreckage. It had suffered a catastrophic implosion. As the Polar Prince gets ready to dock, this isn't the end of its story. The vessel is going to be investigated. There are lots of questions about how, why and when did this disaster happen. The buoyancy tanks used to launch the sub were towed away. Inspectors from Canada's Transportation Safety Board entered the vessel. They will interview staff and crew. The US Coast Guard will also be involved. Wreckage of the sub will be examined too. Its owner, Oceangate, is facing criticism. The BBC has seen emails which accuse the late CEO, Stockton Rush, of putting clients at risk, which the firm has denied. Once you leave that gut, it's very, very dangerous. When you the tragedy has affected people here, in a province used to maritime disasters. you got to have respect for the ocean, because you might not fear it, but you got to have respect for it, because if not... The ocean comes first. We hope for the best outcome, but it was really tragic to hear. Um, I, I, you know, deep down we always have a little bit of hope, but yeah, it was really, really sad. My God, what they're going through, you know, you, you don't wish that on no family, no family whatsoever. I would have wished a better outcome, maybe, but it's too unforgiving out there. The chances of the men's bodies being recovered is near impossible. But these investigations will aim to bring answers and some closure to their grieving families. Nomi Rickbell, BBC News, St John's, Newfoundland. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm Helena Humphrey in Washington, D.C. We'll have more on the chaotic day in Russia, plus other important stories of the day at the top of the hour. Of course, in the meantime, you can always head to our website. That is bbc.com forward slash news. And remember, stay with us here on BBC News if you can. Bye for now. vehicles are all electric. The feeling is all Mercedes. The choice is all yours. See your dealer for exceptional offers today. And obviously it did eventually all come out. These British women fought to keep their gambling addiction a secret until they were offered a lifeline, a place in a residential centre and a chance to confront their addiction. I can't remember the exact amount but I, it shocked my parents, it shocked my partner at the time. I think it worked out to be like £30,000 in the space of three months. Recent studies indicate that around the world the number of women gambling is growing and for those with addiction it's often done in secret. We seem to be sleepwalking it feels like towards a problem.
Live from Washington, this is BBC News. A dramatic day in Russia from rebellion to retreat after Wagner's boss goes rogue. We'll have the latest. It's been one year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, sparking protests across the country. And we'll have the latest on the investigation into the Titan submersible, which was destroyed last week. All five people on board were killed. I'm Helena Humphrey. Good to have you with us. We start with what has been an extraordinary 24 hours in Russia. The head of the Wagner mercenary group, Evgeny Prigozhin, has left for Belarus. Prigozhin told his forces to return to their bases earlier to avoid bloodshed after negotiations with Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko to end their rebellion against the Russian Defense Ministry. Well, Wagner fighters have been leaving the southern city of Rostov-on-Don. That's according to reports. Security had been tightened in Moscow, with the mayor telling residents to avoid traveling. And all mass outdoor events have been canceled until the 1st of July. But Russia's TASS news agency is now reporting that all restrictions previously imposed and Russia's motorways have now been lifted. And here you can see the Wagner leader departing Russia for Belarus earlier following the announcement to cancel the rebellion. Prior to that announcement, a huge convoy had been heading towards Moscow in what Vladimir Putin had described as an attempted mutiny and charges against Prigozhin and his Wagner forces will be dropped. President Putin's press secretary said that Wagner mercenaries who wish to sign a Ministry of Defense contract can and that fighters who took part in the uprising will not be prosecuted. <laughs> Well, a video substantiated by BBC Verify shows a Wagner fighter firing his rifle into the sky as he and other mercenaries withdraw from Rostov. Here you can see tanks boarding trucks leaving the area. And earlier in an audio message posted on Telegram, Prigozhin said that the time had come to stand down. They wanted to disband the Wagner. On June 23rd, we went out on a justice march. Within a day, we were just 200 kilometers away from Moscow. During that time, we did not spill a single drop of blood of our fighters. Now the moment has come when the blood can be spilled. Therefore, understanding all the responsibility for the fact that Russian blood will be spilled on one of the sides, we are turning our columns back and leaving in the opposite direction to the field camps according to the plan. Well, in the last hour, our colleagues at BBC Russian have also reported on an explosion heard in the southeast Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. That's according to the public broadcaster in Ukraine. An air raid alert has apparently been declared in the region. Now, Zaporizhia is the site of the largest nuclear power plant in Europe that was captured by the Russians last May. This news comes after Ukraine's President Zelensky accused Russia of plotting a terror attack on the plant. Moscow denies this. Well, earlier I spoke to former CNN Pentagon correspondent and senior fellow at the University for Southern California, Barbara Starr, for her thoughts on all of this. Barbara, it's been great having your analysis um, on the program. Prigozhin, of course, as we know, reportedly headed to Belarus. Is, that, is this it for this open feud with the Defence Ministry? I know it's a huge question, but where could this potentially go? Well, does it, you know, the question, does anybody think Bergosian's going to quietly go into retirement and live happily into old age? Uh, people who challenge Russian leadership, that does not often happen to them. So that will be one thing to watch. What will happen to the Wagner Group? They have some 50,000 fighters inside Ukraine, according to the British MOD at one point. And, and the big question perhaps right now is what about Putin? How damaged is he? Is his position weaker? Will he lash out? And the Russian military high command, uh, the defense minister Shoigu, the chief of staff Gerasimov, these are guys that Putin had not been, uh, that he had been estranged from them, from them in recent days. Uh, perhaps the one thing he had in common with Prigozhin is neither of them liked the way the war was being prosecuted at some point. And it was a few days ago that the U.S. intelligence community began to see the signs of this, that Prigozhin might have been stockpiling ammunition, weapons. What was he going to do with all of that? That's still a big question. Did he really think he was going to get to Moscow and depose Putin? It seems extraordinarily unlikely. So what happened here and what's going to happen now? 
and very few people know the answer. Huge question marks, as you say, Barbara, right now. In light of these remarkable events, what kind of conversations do you think that the U.S. administration is having behind closed doors right now? Well, I think they're probably trying to figure out topic number one. What happens with Putin now? Will he remain in power? Will he remain in power as strong as he is right now? Is his, uh, is his position damaged? Will that emerge? If it is, does that emerge right away or does it sort of chip away over time? And if there is that kind of instability in Russia, further instability, what does that mean? What does it mean for uh, the Russian military? What does it mean for the war in Ukraine? What does it mean for NATO's eastern flank that butts up against uh, Russia and Ukraine? Because, you know, it's one thing. The intelligence community needs to gather as much information as it can, learn more. They know that's their job. For the U.S. military and for the military services in Europe along that eastern flank, what they don't like is uncertainty. They want to know what they need to be prepared for. And right now, they just can't be sure. Well, on that point, you know, about uncertainty, do you think there'll also be a conversation here about being a little bit caught out? Are there any indications that U.S. officials were slightly surprised right. by this? I think that they, there are indications they knew, but they didn't know exactly. So was it knowable, if you will, that what Prigozhin was going to do and how Putin might react and that Lukashenko would be brought into all of this. This became a very complicated mix of developments with just within several hours. So was that even knowable? And they will have to go back and look at that. Will we ever find out the answer? Mm, maybe not. But, but they will need to go back and figure out what they heard, what they saw, what intelligence they had and what it really all added up to, and did they miss any signs so they don't miss them next time. Exactly. Barbara Starr, former Pentagon correspondent at CNN, also a senior fellow at the USC Annenberg Center in California. Really great having you with us Thanks. tonight. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you. Well, according to the New York Times, U.S. security officials were warned as early as Wednesday that Prigozhin was preparing to act. Now, the newspaper cited U.S. intelligence sources and noted their immediate concern and had been how it would affect Moscow's control of its nuclear weapons arsenal. Well, in the last hour, I spoke to Democratic Congressman Jason Crow, who shared his perspective on the latest developments. Just to begin with, your thoughts on what we've been seeing well, I mean, this has been uh, surprising that it's happened as soon as it has happened. It's not surprising that this necessarily happened. Those who, uh, of us who have been watching the Wagner Group in, in Russia and Ukraine uh, for a while now have seen how Prigozhin has been consolidating power, how he's been arming and equipping his force, how he's been pushing back uh, on the Russian military establishment and, and kind of actually testing his power both politically and militarily over the last year. So it's not surprising this has happened, but the speed of which he marched on Moscow and how quickly uh, he got uh, and as far as he got to Moscow was pretty shocking. So how do you think this could impact the U.S., Russia? Well, in a couple of ways. Number one, Putin is absolutely weaker. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but also the Russian military and their war machine is significantly weaker. So you have disrupted command and control with the Russian military. There's going to be a lot of changes in the Russian military in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, you have uh, drastically hit uh, the morale of the Russian military, but you've also taken one of the biggest and most powerful tools that Putin had at, at his disposal, that is the Wagner Group, this mercenary army of over 30,000, some of the most experienced, battle-tested uh, soldiers that they had in their arsenal, and you've taken that off the field. I mean, this is the force that actually has been holding the line for the Russians for the last six months in places like Bakhmut uh, in the south and the eastern uh, provinces. Uh, they, they are now effectively neutralized on the battlefield at the same time the Ukrainians are pushing their counteroffensive. So it, it absolutely will have an impact. Mm. And so, Congressman, how do you think then that the Ukrainians can use this to their advantage on the battlefield? Well, you know, in war, I'm, I'm a former Army Ranger, so I've been to war three times in Iraq and Afghanistan in special operations capacity. And when, one of the, the, uh, the principles of war is that when there's an opening, and something happens, you need to be, be able to move quickly, boldly, and ag aggressively to take advantage of that. So that's what I think the Ukrainians will do. They've never missed an opportunity to kind of take advantage of an opening. So uh, being bold right now is probably something they're looking at doing.
So if you've got that situation happening on the ground there in Ukraine, you've got Prigozhin going to Belarus. We don't essentially know what his role will be there, but we know that that feud between Putin and Prigozhin has clearly been spilling out into the open. Are there concerns that essentially we could see this spill over into an even more serious conflict? And if that's the case, what should the U.S. do? Well, there's no doubt about that. A weekend... Uh, an insecure Vladimir Putin is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm no fan of Putin and would love to see him uh, not be uh, the leader of Russia. Uh, but you have to look at the, the global political element here, too. The Wagner Group has its uh, arms in lots of different places around the world, in Africa, in the Middle East. Uh, there are a number of countries and autocrats who actually rely on the Wagner Group uh, for their own security and to prop up their regimes. Uh, so uh, we have to keep a close eye on whether those mercenaries withdraw from those areas, uh, whether command and control is destabilized, and, and whether other conflicts in, in Africa and the Middle East in particular uh, might be uh, uh, coming uh, to the surface here in the weeks ahead. And how should the, the Biden administration respond to that? Well, one thing the Biden administration is already doing is they've been engaging over the last couple of months with some of the countries that have been very reluctant to take sides in this conflict and have been silent about Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And they've been talking to these countries and saying, look, this, this is the, uh, the, uh, the battle for freedom and democracy. You can't stay neutral here. Russia is not a stable and reliable partner, and you should come our way. It's, it's, it's more beneficial for you to align uh, with democracies than it is autocracies. Uh, and uh, actually, as a matter of fact, there are senior Biden administration officials in Europe right now meeting with some of those uh, countries, uh, delegations from uh, places in uh, the global South, Africa, uh, and, and other places, trying to make that case. And, and frankly, all they have to do is turn the TV on, uh, and that kind of makes the case for them that there's no future uh, in partnering with an autocratic country, and particularly Russia, because there's no predictability and stability in that. Jason Crow, Democratic member of the U.S. House of Representatives, who sits on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. We thank you for being with us. Thank you. Well, uh, let's take a look back now at the past 24 hours. Early Friday, Prigozhin questioned the war in Ukraine, blaming Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, claiming he did it to gain military honors. Prigozhin called for an armed rebellion and accused the Kremlin of hitting his troops with a missile strike on Friday. In Moscow, security stepped up as Wagner takes Rostov on Don. On Saturday, Prigozhin declared that 25,000 of his troops crossed the border from Ukraine in the early hours of the morning. Russian President Vladimir Putin denounced what he called a criminal adventure. He warned of punishments in a TV address. And over the course of the day, Wagner forces made progress towards Moscow, seizing military facilities in Varanej. Now, just hours ago, Prigozhin said that he had agreed to stop the movement of his troops, turning them around from their route to Moscow. Belarus revealed that its leader, Alexander Lukashenko, had been holding talks with Prigozhin and Putin. Russian state media reported Prigozhin is leaving for Belarus and criminal charges against him and his troops will be dropped. Well, as Wagner's leader leaves for Belarus, I spoke to Hanna Lubakova, a Belarusian journalist and researcher. Anna, welcome to the program and thank you for being with us. Firstly, what do you make of reports that it was President Lukashenko who brokered this deal? Why was he the person to do so, do you think? I think we should not exaggerate Lukashenko's role here. So first of all, both Minsk and Moscow keep saying that uh, he played a really significant role. Uh, but at the same time, he might have been uh, just a technical player here. He might have just served as a uh, sort of form of support after the uh, real negotiations took place between uh, the real actors, uh, who is Putin and Prigozhin. And we see the results of it. We see that Prigozhin is thought to be sent to Minsk, to Belarus. But the question is here, what role, who, 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 who Prigozhin, what Prigozhin is going to do in Minsk? What role he's going to play there? Is he going to stay in power, in charge of Wagner Group and so on? But I think most importantly here, what it shows to us is, is that Lukashenko plays the role of Putin's puppet and Belarus became like a backyard for Russia. And do we know more about the deal which he reportedly brokered and the reported guarantees? 
We don't have many details now. Uh, the Kremlin's spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, only said that uh, Prigozhin will go to, to Belarus. Uh, at the same time, Wagner mercenaries will, um, those who did not participate in this um, armed rebellion, they could continue fighting, they could sign agreements with uh, the Russian army. Um, and it's not clear what uh, they would do with the rest. They also, Piskov also said that uh, Prigozhin's criminal case uh, will um, will be forgotten, basically. So it's like an amnesty, I think, for Prigozhin. Well, what about the role of President Lukashenko here? Will it be his role to try and ensure that Yevgeny Prigozhin doesn't do something like this again in the future? It might be the case, but I don't really think that Lukashenko has enough tools to stop Prigozhin from doing the same thing again. Let's remember that in just one day, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin was able to um, almost reach Moscow. Um, so I don't really think that a man with uh, such ambitions and uh, an ability to risk uh, in this situation would really listen to Lukashenko. Um, but again, I think that if Putin will ask Lukashenko to um, to somehow control Prigozhin or or uh, somehow speak with him. So Lukashenko will certainly do this. And what does this say about the relationship between Vladimir Putin and Lukashenko and also Belarus's role in this war? It had previously been used as a staging post at various points. Do you think we could see that happening again? Of course, um, Lukashenko is fully involved in, in this war in the sense that he supports Putin in every way possible. Belarus became a springboard for the invasion uh, in the beginning of the um, of the of the full scale invasion in February. Now it serves mostly as a training ground. Lukashenko uh, supports Putin in every way. Um, however, this uh, recent uh, rebellion of Prigozhin also showed the weakness of Putin. And I think this will also have a lot of effects on Lukashenko and on the entire regime, on the entire system in Belarus. And definitely weakened Lukashenko means weakened, uh, weakened Putin means weakened Lukashenko. So I think this is one of the greatest uh, results of this entire situation because it will definitely affect the moods inside Belarus. Look might seem victorious right now, might seem as one who benefited from the situation as this negotiator in chief. But I think it's not in the longer term, it will only affect him. And so ultimately, what do you think this means for the Belarusian people? They will be seeing, uh, you know, a feud essentially between Prigozhin and Putin play out in the open. They will see Lukashenko as the strong ally once again of Putin. What do they think that this will mean for them? I think it also shows that the Belarusian people that the future of the regime depends on the situation of Putin in Russia, on the Kremlin. So this brings Belarus again closer to the Kremlin. And this definitely makes this friendship in a way or this alliance between Lukashenko and Putin stronger for now. Uh, but they also see that Russian instability also affects Belarus and that Russia is not really that strong and uh, invincible as Lukashenko keeps uh, showing to the Belarusian population. Hanna Lubakova, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. And for more on this story, you can always head to the BBC News website and app for full background analysis and, of course, always the latest BBC reporting. Now, it's been one year since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling that gave women the constitutional right to abortion. And as activists marched across the country to mark the day, anti-abortion rallies also took place. Former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence urged his Republican rivals in the race for the White House to support a nationwide ban on abortion after 15 weeks. As we celebrate the progress that we've made, we gather here knowing that we've not come to the end of this cause. We've come to the end of the beginning. And the work for life goes on all across America. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris said that the overturning of Roe versus Wade had created a health crisis. Right now in our country, 23 million women of reproductive age live in a state with an extreme abortion ban in effect. 
23 million women, which means right now in our country, one in three women of reproductive age live in a state with a ban. Well, here's more from our North America correspondent, Sophie Long. Legal abortion on demand! Legal As news broke of the Supreme Court's ruling, protests erupted across America. Abortion became illegal automatically in some states. In others, bans were swiftly signed into effect and clinics closed. Mississippi's last abortion provider is now a furniture shop. But those who worked here are still performing the procedure. Two states and 17 hours drive away in New Mexico. We moved everything from Jackson here and we opened the facility here for women. Uh, mostly, we mostly serve Texas women here. I think it's a great loss for the women in Mississippi. I think it's a, um, <laughs> I think it, they have taken it just like they have everything else in Mississippi and they've taken Mississippi backwards. In Mississippi, everything has changed and nothing has changed. In the poorest parts of America's poorest state, for some, accessing an abortion was almost impossible before the ban. Often the only support available is at crisis pregnancy centers run by anti-abortion organizations. I understand single parenthood. I understand not knowing if food will be there. I understand the lack of resources. I understand what a lot of these women are going through. I understand um, infertility. I understand the decision of do I abort, do I keep. I understand a lot of things that maybe when you look at women like me are, are others that run facilities like this that we don't understand, but we, we do. Over the past 12 months, the United States has become a confusing patchwork of abortion laws. In Texas, where I am now, it's illegal. But just across the border in New Mexico, women still have the right to choose. And so doctors like Aaron Campbell travel thousands of miles every week to perform the procedure legally. I'm not in my own clinic because we had to close. It's a felony in Tennessee to provide abortion. I believe in this right for people to be able to make this decision for themselves. And I believe that they should be able to get that care from someone who knows how to do this safely. Meanwhile, in Mississippi, even though terminating an unwanted pregnancy is now illegal, anti-abortion activists continue their campaign. The abortion pill, the poison pill in Mississippi, we know that it can be sent through the mail or across the border. So we're, you know, we're concerned about women still obtaining unsafe abortions without the proper medical care. And then also women can still go across state lines. Last year, an important battle may have been won by the anti-abortion lobby. But the fight over reproductive rights in America continues with no end in sight. Sophie Long, BBC News, Mississippi. Investigators in Canada have boarded the support ship used to launch the Titan submersible, which was destroyed last week. All five people on board were killed. Now, the ship, the Polar Prince, returned to port in Newfoundland, where officials are gathering information. Nomi Iqbal reports. The Polar Prince made its long journey home, nearly a week since it left for the high seas. A flag flew at half-mast out of respect for the five men who died. These are among the last known pictures of the submersible. The Polar Prince launched it into the Atlantic last Sunday, but contact was lost an hour and 45 minutes later. They notified the Coast Guard after more than four hours. Following an international search lasting days, parts of the sub were eventually found on the seabed near the Titanic wreckage. It had suffered a catastrophic implosion. As the Polar Prince gets ready to dock, this isn't the end of its story. The vessel is going to be investigated. There are lots of questions about how, why and when did this disaster happen. The buoyancy tanks used to launch the sub were towed away. Inspectors from Canada's Transportation Safety Board entered the vessel. They will interview staff and crew. The US Coast Guard will also be involved. Wreckage of the sub will be examined too. Its owner, Ocean Gate, is facing criticism. 
The BBC has seen emails which accuse the late CEO Stockton Rush of putting clients at risk, which the firm has denied. Once you leave that gut, it's very, very dangerous. When you the tragedy has affected people here, in a province used to maritime disasters. you got to have respect for the ocean, because you might not fear it, but you got to have respect for it, because if not, the ocean comes first. We hope for the best outcome, but it was really tragic to hear. Um, I, I, you know, deep down we always have a little bit of hope, but yeah, it was really, really sad. My God, what they're going through, you know, you, you don't wish that on no family, no family whatsoever. I would have wished a better outcome, maybe, but it's too unforgiving out there. The chances of the men's bodies being recovered is near impossible. But these investigations will aim to bring answers and some closure to their grieving families. Nomi Rickbell, BBC News, St John's, Newfoundland. You're watching BBC News. I'm Helena Humphrey in Washington, D.C. Thanks for your company. I'll see you soon. Bye for now. excess baggage but we think you're worth it the travel show on bbc news Four fifty-five on the morning of february the 24th i found myself at the heart of war president putin has announced what he calls a special military operation as journalists we will never truly understand what it feels like to have your home destroyed but the next best thing is for us to find those people and bear witness to what they have gone through. There are endless moments when this war feels pointless and this is one of them. There are so many human tales of survival and recovery. An undeniable moment, President Zelensky appearing in the heart of her song. Many predicted Russian troops would be wandering Kiev within days. Ukraine's defense has been both surprising and extraordinary. Sadly, this war is still happening and we will continue to tell the story of the conflict in Ukraine. Live from London, this is BBC News. Wagner boss Evgeny Prigozhin leaves for Belarus and the Kremlin says he will face no charges for his mutiny. The Wagner troops leave too and will not face prosecution, bringing an end to an historic day. This is one of those moments where you just have to put up your hands and say, what on earth was that about? Reports of an explosion near the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia, the site of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Hello and welcome. I'm Nancy Kachingira. Thank you for joining us. The threat of a major uprising against the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, appears to have receded after a deal was struck which enabled the rebel leader to retreat. Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner mercenary group, pictured here leaving the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don, is to leave for Belarus. And with Wagner forces firing their guns into the sky and cheers from the watching public, his troops also departed the city just hours after they controlled a military building with further Wagner troops moving towards Moscow. Traveling north on the M4 motorway, passing the city of Voronezh, and they were spotted as far north as the Lipetsk region, which is around 300 miles south of Moscow. And then in the early evening, Prigozhin announced that he had agreed to stop the advance after a deal was brokered by the Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko. 
Our correspondent Steve Rosenberg looks back on a historic day. This is how the day began. In the Russian city of Rostov, armed men and armor on the streets and tanks outside key buildings. In control here, the mercenary group Wagner. Closely linked to the state, they'd fought for Russia in Ukraine. But this looked like mutiny. Their leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, seemed to have gone rogue after his feud with the Russian Defence Ministry boiled over over how the war in Ukraine is being fought. At a military HQ, he told Russian generals, we've come for the defence minister and the chief of the general staff. If we don't get them, I'll blockade the city and head to Moscow. This was treachery, said the Kremlin, a stab in the back of Russia. Our actions to defend the fatherland from this threat will be harsh. Everyone who consciously chose the path of treason and planned the armed uprising has embraced blackmail and terrorist methods. They will be inevitably punished before the law and our people. Tension rose as reports came in of Wagner convoys moving north to Moscow. Was this heading towards confrontation in the capital? Then, out of the blue, a message from Mr. Prigozhin. To avoid bloodshed, he said, Wagner would turn around and return to base. A de-escalation deal that the leader of Belarus claims to have negotiated. Conflict cooled off. This is one of those moments where you just have to put up your hands and say, what on earth was that about? I mean, just a few hours ago, Yevgeny Prigozhin seemed determined to march his men to the top of the hill. And then he marched them down again. We may never know what agreements were or weren't reached between the key players of this bizarre drama. Confused, Muscovites were by the whole affair. Before, they told us Wagner was good, Svetlana says. They gave them medals for fighting in a special military operation. Now suddenly they're villains? That's hard for me to get used to. Preparing to leave Rostov tonight, Wagner fighters got quite a send-off. They're celebrating what they clearly see as a victory after a day of drama. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Moscow. Well, let's take a closer look now at the man who called for the rebellion, Evgeny Pogosian, and the group of mercenary soldiers that he leads, known as the Wagner Group. Here's our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, with the details. Evgeny Prigozhin, outside Russian military headquarters in Rostov-on-Don this morning, boasting his Wagner group have taken it without firing a shot. But just who is this man challenging Russia's leaders? Prigozhin began as a criminal from St. Petersburg. After leaving jail, he began selling hot dogs, but then graduated to running expensive restaurants. He caught the attention of Russia's leader, leading him to be known as Putin's chef. He catered to world leaders when they visited, even America's president, but also became rich from lucrative military contracts. About a decade ago, he began to carry out operations around the world on behalf of the Kremlin, even interfering in America's 2016 election. But Prigozhin became best known as head of Wagner, an often brutal private mercenary group working to the Kremlin's agenda. It's been operating across the Middle East and Africa, including Syria, Libya and Mali, allowing Putin to project power without being directly involved. But it's in the last year in Ukraine that it's really come to the fore. As Putin's plans for a quick victory faded, Prigozhin's forces undertook some of the heaviest fighting. Some of them came from prisons. Here's Prigozhin recruiting them in return for an early release. Laying flowers on the graves of those who died helped him cultivate an image in Russia as a nationalist hero, one who would fight harder in Ukraine. But battles like in Bakhmut led to growing tension between Prigozhin and the regular Russian military leadership.
he angrily accused its leaders, like Defence Minister Shoigu and Military Chief Gerasimov, of using his men as cannon fodder and denying them vital supplies. Shoigu! Gerasimov! Where are Prigozhin claimed Russia's soldiers had been let down by their leaders, and his attacks on them became increasingly outspoken. It was clear one side or other would have to move, bringing what had been a simmering crisis to the boil. Let's go live now and speak to Steve Fish, politics professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Thanks for joining us once again. Uh, well, if we were confused yesterday when this mutiny began, we might be more confused now that it's ended. What's your view of what's happened in Russia over the past 24 hours or so? Well, one of the thing that's, things that's come out of this is that Yevgeny Prigozhin now looks like the strongest guy in Russia. Remember, in a dictatorship like Putin's, the main way that the top guy stays in power is to look stronger and tougher than everybody else. He wants to look unassailable. What Prigozhin has done has really given the lie to the idea that Putin is fully in charge. Prigozhin went rogue months ago with his operation in Ukraine. He's actually been battling against um, army troops in Ukraine for some time now. But he's the guy who's been able to roll up some gains on the ground. And so Putin hasn't been able to abandon him. He's gotten stronger and stronger. He's putting out videos every day about his own exploits in the field, while the main army troops actually have, have managed to do very little. So he already was a, was a, a kind of emerging in Russia as a kind of war hero, famous for his exploits in the field. Then he decides he's going to turn things around and invade Russia. Russia. Before he does that, he issues a, a video where he calls into question the entire narrative that Putin has told about the war and about the justification for the war. In that video, Prigozhin says that the whole story about East Ukrainians, that is, Russian speakers in East Ukraine being abused by the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian government being run by a bunch of Nazis, he says that's complete nonsense. He says NATO never threatened Russia in any way through Ukraine. Instead, he said the whole invasion was just about glorifying the Minister of Defense. The whole, the whole invasion of Ukraine was basically about just getting stuff for Putin's oligarchs to steal. So we completely undermines Putin's war narrative. That's sin number one. Then he invades Russia with his own troops. That's, of course, sin number two. And Putin can't stop him. He's greeted with open arms by people in Rostov, the major military city in the south. He takes over the military facility. That's the head of Southern Command in the Russian military. Military, and then he rolls on to Moscow. But He's after all that, uh, Steve, after all that, I think one thing that people might be confused about is why go on this grand tirade, you know, call out things like corruption, uh, call out, you know, what he said about the war, as you've mentioned there, and then just turn around and say, that's OK, it's all over now. Well, he probably realized, Prigozhin probably realized that he wasn't going to be able to make it all the way to Moscow and take over Moscow. So he decided to cut his losses, stop along the way, and was able to negotiate an agreement with Putin, which actually let him off scot-free. This is a deal negotiated by, apparently, by the dictator of Belarus. And again, it made Prigozhin come off looking very strong. Putin had just given a grim-faced speech just hours before, claiming that the country was on the verge of chaos. He compared the situation to 1917. And then he turns around and basically pardons Prigozhin and lets him get out. This is the best possible situation for Prigozhin, and it makes him come off looking like the toughest guy in Russia. Oh, um, look, listening to some of the people who uh, 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 reporters were speaking to in Russia after this. Uh, I wonder how far that uh, narrative really goes because uh, one woman, for instance, told Reuters, it doesn't frighten me at all. I have confidence in our president and our people. Uh, president Lukashenko was one of the first people that President Putin spoke to after this crisis emerged. Uh, he is a close ally of President Putin. He has broken the deal. Could some of this come off or at least could Putin try to spin this as he took control of the situation, he solved the problem, so he doesn't come off looking weak at all. Of course he'll try to spin it this way, but one of the other people that you interviewed just in your previous report also said, look, Prigozhin's been treated by our government as this great hero. 
for many months now. And now we're supposed to regard him as a villain. We thought he was the guy who was really taking charge and making some gains on the ground in Ukraine. Then Putin gives a speech saying, no, this awful guy is trying to take over our, our government and ruin our country. But then he cuts a deal with Prigozhin that basically drops charges against him and lets him go to Belarus. I can tell you, a lot of people in Russia now are, are wondering about how tough Putin really is and if he can main this, maintain the situation. What's more, Prigozhin was not stopped by the Russian military on the way into Moscow. He just stopped voluntarily, probably realized he wasn't going to be able to make it all the way there. And he negotiated a, uh, a truce in which his troops basically will probably end up going back to Ukraine. He's going to go to Belarus for a while, but look, he's not going to stay there for long. I wouldn't be surprised to see, see him back in Ukraine or perhaps causing trouble somewhere else in the world very soon. So he comes out very looking like a winner. Okay, so you don't think that this relationship between uh, Prigozhin and Putin is over. I mean, what what is next for Prigozhin? You've hinted there that you don't think he'll stay in Belarus very long. And what happens to his troops who are still in Russia? Well, apparently they're supposed to be integrated into the main military. It's not clear that's actually going to happen. There's also the danger, and Putin knows this perfectly well, that even among Russia's regular military groups, they're looking to Prigozhin now as the guy who can get things done. They're looking to Prigozhin now as the guy who's actually standing up and telling the truth about the profiteering that's going on in this war, that's telling the truth about the fact that Putin is sending hundreds of thousands of men into this conflict and into this meat grinder and doesn't really care about their fate. Prigozhin again comes off looking like the guy who cares about the troops, who's standing up for them. And Putin's very concerned that, in fact, that could infect the thinking of the entire military. Also, Prigozhin comes off in the Russian elite is looking like the one guy who could stand up to Putin. And remember, in a system like Putin's, if anybody's willing to stand up to the main man and can get away with it, then he really ends up looking like the biggest guy in, on, in town. And that's very bad for Putin. All right, we'll leave it there. But thank you very much, uh, Steve Fish, a politics professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, really good to talk to you. Thank you. My pleasure. All the response from other countries to events in Russia was cautious. NATO said they were watching events closely and the leaders of the US, France, Germany and the UK held a call to discuss the situation in which they reaffirmed their support for Ukraine. Following events from the U.S. and how the White House reacted, here's CBS News foreign affairs correspondent Christina Ruffini. Well, the U.S. is watching this very closely. President Biden was at the White House this morning and had what is essentially an all-hands meeting. National Security Advisor, CIA Director, Secretary of State, where they all sat and talked about this and tried to figure out essentially what was happening because, as you know, the, the news and the information was dripping out very slowly. Now, President Biden has since gone on to Camp David for the weekend, but he's taken his National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, with him. Sullivan was supposed to be overseas in Copenhagen for a conference, ironically, on Ukraine, but he's staying close to the president as officials watch this unfold. Now, as you mentioned, congressional leaders, according to my CBS colleagues, have been briefed multiple times in the past in the past days about the danger posed by the Wagner Group. But it's unclear at this point what exactly that danger was. And if the U.S. intelligence knew that this specific, uh, you know, incident could play out, if this was the risk posed, you know, the Wagner Group has its fingers in many regions and many conflicts around the world. They've been a known quantity for a while, the U.S. officials. Um, but but, you know, as 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 officials and former officials and diplomats all over the world kind of reacted to this today, I heard a lot of expletives or, and then got texted off the record a lot of expletives as everyone was trying to figure out what the blank was going on. So I think as events try to calm down a little bit, we'll see a little bit more of a regroup and some statements. But for the moment, the statements we've seen have mainly been the president, the secretary of state, the defense officials reaching out to their counterparts in Europe, reaching out to their allies as everybody kind of tries to get on the same page and, and watch essentially what, it, what unfolded today overseas. Previously, until the what the Russians call their special operations, operation in Ukraine, the U.S. goal for Russian policy had been essentially to put guardrails on the relationship. And as one former official told me today, the war in Ukraine basically drew a, grew, uh, drove a big armored tank through those guardrails, and they no longer exist. So the U.S. has been trying to manage this relationship, and I think it's a wait-and-see kind of situation. Officials are all kind to step back. 
I think the instincts, a lot of people have said, well, this has to be good for the U.S., right? Anything that's bad for Putin is good for the U.S. That's not necessarily the case. President Biden may not be a huge fan of President Putin, but the bigger fear is Russia is a major nuclear weapons holder, and the U.S. does not want those nuclear weapons falling into the hands of an unpredictable actor or even for the Kremlin to lose command and control. So that's something officials here in Europe and around the world are very concerned about as they watch this play out inside Russia. CBS reporter Christina Ruffini there. Jason Crow, Democratic member of the U.S. House of Representatives who sits on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, warned of the ongoing threat posed by the Wagner Group. Uh, an insecure Vladimir Putin is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, no, get me wrong, I'm no fan of Putin and would love to see him uh, not be uh, the leader of Russia. Uh, but you have to look at the, the global political element here, too. The Wagner Group has its uh, arms in lots of different places around the world, in Africa, in the Middle East. Uh, there are a number of countries and autocrats who actually rely on the Wagner Group uh, for their own security and to prop up their regimes. Uh, so uh, we have to keep a close eye on whether those mercenaries withdraw from those areas, uh, whether command and control is destabilized, and, and whether other conflicts in, in Africa and the Middle East in particular uh, might be uh, uh, coming uh, to the surface here in the weeks ahead. But one thing the Biden administration is already doing is they've been engaging over the last couple of months with some of the countries that have been very reluctant to take sides in this conflict and have been silent about Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And they've been talking to these countries and saying, look, this, this is the, uh, the, uh, the battle for freedom and democracy. You can't stay neutral here. Russia is not a stable and reliable partner, and you should come our way. It's, it's, it's more beneficial for you to align uh, with democracies than it is autocracies. Uh, and uh, actually, as a matter of fact, there are senior Biden administration officials in Europe right now meeting with some of those uh, countries, uh, delegations from uh, places in uh, the global South, Africa uh, and, and other places trying to make that case. And, and frankly, all they have to do is turn the TV on. Uh, and that kind of makes the case for them that there's no future uh, in partnering with an autocratic country and particularly Russia, because there's no predictability and stability in that. Jason Crow is a Democratic member of the U.S. House of Representatives. More reaction from London. The government held its emergency cabinet committee, known as COBRA, to discuss the impact of the events in Russia. Here's the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. It's an evolving situation, and I think the right thing at this juncture is for us to make sure that we're on top of it, that we're in touch with our allies, which we are, and I'll be speaking to them later today, and that we call on all parties to exercise responsibility and to protect civilian lives. I think that's the most important thing for us in the UK to be doing at this juncture. So as we've been discussing, in just over a day, events escalated and then de-escalated quickly. Let's take a look back at what happened. On Friday, the Wagner boss launched a rant blaming the Russian defense minister for the war in Ukraine and called for a march for justice. He then also called for an armed rebellion and security was stepped up across Russia, including in the capital, Moscow. Prigozhin declared that 25,000 of his troops crossed into Russia from Ukraine and then took control of a military building in Rostov, near the Ukrainian border. As security continued to be tightened in Moscow, President Putin issued a statement on television denouncing what he called the criminal adventure and warned of punishment. Over the course of the day, Wagner forces made their way up the M4 motorway from Rostov towards Moscow, seizing military facilities in Voronezh along the way. But then in the early evening in Russia, Prigozhin told his troops to stop. Later, it was revealed that a deal had been reached between the Wagner chief and Putin, with Prigozhin heading to Belarus, and that he would face no criminal charges. Well, in Kiev, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, said that the Wagner mutiny was a clear sign of weakness in the Kremlin. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces have been pushing to recapture some of the territory that was invaded by Russia, including settlements in the eastern Donetsk region and the southern region of Zaporizhia. But progress has been slow. Fighting is also continuing around the eastern city of Bakhmut, most of which is still under Russian control after prolonged fighting. And this is where the Wagner Group have suffered heavy losses. Our correspondent Andrew Harding reports from the Donbass in eastern Ukraine. A warning, you may find some of the scenes upsetting. A Ukrainian army doctor rushes to help yet another casualty this morning near the front lines. 
Russia may be in disarray today, but the fighting here, near the town of Bakhmut, is as ferocious as ever. Rough and ready treatment for this soldier, who's got a chunk of shrapnel in his thigh. The doctor here, his call sign is Yoda, plots the next rescue mission to the nearby battlefield. As for the news of a mutiny in Russia, with weary eyes, Yoda says, most of us don't really believe it, or maybe it's a performance, something to try to distract us. What matters is that we fight on. They're just heading off now to the front line to pick up some more wounded. The fighting seems to be getting much more intense around Bakhmut, and the word from the Ukrainians is that they are advancing now steadily, meter by meter. So are Ukrainian troops already taking advantage of the chaos in Russia's military? That must surely be the plan. There is certainly a big opportunity to seize here, with Ukraine's counter-offensive already poised to move up several gears. That's Ukrainian jets flying around. Two Ukrainian jets flying very low overhead. We're having to stay under the trees here because the, the medics here are telling us that Russian drones are constantly patrolling every day looking for them. Another doctor, known as Afghan, who I last met a year ago, is weary and cautious about what comes next. How is the counter-offensive going? Hmm. Difficult? Yes as if to prove the point. Incoming Russian artillery. Then another casualty arrives from the front. 56-year-old Alexander, more shrapnel. And yet, as heavy as the fighting still is, there's renewed hope here that a demoralized, divided Russian enemy may be in big trouble, and that Putin's war just might have reached a turning point. Andrew Harding with that report from the Donbass. And with more on the counteroffensive, here's General Douglas Lute, former U.S. permanent representative to NATO. This move over the last 24 hours, exposing weakness in, in the Kremlin, uh, placing at risk the operational headquarters in Rostov, uh, diverting the attention of Russian soldiers, and probably decreasing the morale of Russian frontline soldiers, presents a huge opportunity for the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now is the time uh, to strike while, Ukraine, while Russia's attention is divided, uh, and while Russia has to look not only to the West, to the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive, but now increasingly to the east, uh, and wondering uh, about the loyalties of forces in Russia itself. I think Prigozhin and the Wagner Group will be cut down to size. I don't, I don't buy this recent explanation that uh, Lukashenko and Belarus uh, mediated some sort of deal uh, that will diffuse the situation and everything will be okay tomorrow. Uh, I think in the coming days you're going to see. Um, if, a, a harsh form of Putin justice uh, brought to Prigozhin and his and the leadership of the Wagner Group. Uh, this will not be forgiven and forgotten. General Douglas Lute there. Don't forget that you can find uh, all our uh, information and everything that's happening in Russia, all the updates on the BBC News website and app. We're tracking every development. Uh, the latest is that all road restrictions in Russia have been lifted, according to state media. And uh, f as we've reported, Wagner forces have left the southern city of Rostov-on-Don. Stay with us on BBC News. I'm Nancy Kachangira. Bye for now. We're Carvana. We've created a brand new way for you to sell your car. Go to Carvana, answer a few questions, and our techno wizardry calculates your car's value and gives you a real offer in seconds. We'll come to you, pay you on the spot, then pick up your car. That's it. At Carvana. Moving forward with node positive breast cancer is overwhelming. But I never just found my way. I made it. 
and did all I could to prevent recurrence. Fresenio reduces the risk of recurrence of HR-positive, HER2-negative, node-positive early breast cancer with a high chance of returning, as determined by your doctor when added to hormone therapy. Hormone therapy works outside the cell, while Fresenio works inside to help stop the growth of cancer cells. Diarrhea is common, may be severe, or cause dehydration or infection. At the first sign, call your doctor, start an antidiarrheal, and drink fluids. Before taking Fresenio, tell your doctor about any fever, chills, or other signs of infection. Fresenio may cause low white blood cell counts, which may cause serious infection that can lead to death. Life-threatening lung inflammation can occur. Tell your doctor about any new or worsening trouble breathing, cough, or chest pain. Serious liver problems can happen. Symptoms include fatigue, appetite loss, stomach pain, and bleeding or bruising. Blood clots that can lead to death have occurred. Tell your doctor if you have pain or swelling in your arms or legs, shortness of breath, chest pain, and rapid breathing or heart rate, or if you are nursing, pregnant, or plan to be. I'm making my own way forward. Ask your doctor about Everyday Verzenio. To be a therapist, in my opinion, is one of the most humbling things ever. A platform like BetterHelp is very important because it allows access to affordable mental health care. With the walls stretching right up to the edges, the entry gate not at all visible from a great distance. And even after the gate is visible, it's very difficult to deboard from a boat. It has numerous bastions, each with numerous cannons, some of them huge. So that makes it ingenious. That is one of the reasons why it is also an unconquered fort. Watch more stories like this at bbc.com slash real. We left everything. Behind every headline, <laughs> there is a human story. <laughs> this is our world. A series of documentary films that reveal the human drama at the heart of global events. Our World on BBC News. Live from London, this is BBC News. Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin leaves for Belarus and the Kremlin says he will face no charges for his mutiny. The Wagner troops leave too and will not face prosecution, bringing an end to an historic day. Reports of an explosion near the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia, the site of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Nancy Kachungira. The threat of a major uprising against the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, appears to have receded after a deal was struck which enabled the rebel leader to retreat. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner mercenary group, pictured leaving the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don, is to leave for Belarus. As the sound of Wagner forces firing their guns into the sky with cheers from the watching public, his troops also departed the city just hours after they controlled a military building with further Wagner troops moving towards Moscow. Travelling north on the M4 motorway, passing the city of Voronezh, and they were spotted as far as north, as far north rather, as the Lipetsk region, which is around 300 miles south of Moscow. And then in the early evening, Prigozhin announced that he had agreed to stop the advance after a deal was brokered by the Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko. With the latest, here's Sarah Rainsford. Mutineers cheered as heroes. 
This crowd are shouting Wagner, the name of the mercenary group that Vladimir Putin had accused of treason only hours earlier. The fighters were clearly among friends here. Just one bizarre scene in a day of high drama. The Wagner group had rolled into Rostov on Saturday morning, placing tanks on city streets and taking over a military command post for the Ukraine war. There, Wagner's boss was filmed haranguing senior military figures. In extraordinary scenes, Yevgeny Prigozhin demanded the downfall of Russia's defense minister and its chief of staff accusing them of mishandling the war on Ukraine. Soon came reports of Wagner troops heading north, though there were very few images. This sign points to Voronezh. That's already halfway to Moscow. In the same region, a driver sees a roadblock. He says Wagner have smashed through. Further north still, a man finds his way home blocked by a trench dug into the tarmac. This march on Moscow turned all eyes on Yevgeny Prigozhin. He's a former convict who became a chef to Vladimir Putin, but he did a lot of the Kremlin's dirty work too, from disinformation by running troll farms to covert fighting in Syria and Ukraine. Since the full-scale invasion, Prigozhin had been recruiting soldiers from prisons for some of the fiercest battles. But he'd also been feuding openly with Russia's defense ministry. And this weekend, that dispute exploded. Vladimir Putin declared the mutiny a betrayal, a stab in the back. But it was a problem that he himself had allowed to get out of hand. As a counter-terror operation was launched to defend the capital, the potential for clashes was clear. And then, as suddenly as it began, it was over. Prigozhin said his men were turning round to avoid bloodshed, and Belarus announced it helped negotiate that. Late last night, pictures emerged of the man himself leaving for Belarus as part of the climb-down deal. Yevgeny Prigozhin's next steps are unclear, like so much in this story. Vladimir Putin didn't win the showdown. He just survived it. For once, the Russian strongman looked weak. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News. Well, Steve Fish, a politics professor at the University of California, Berkeley, told me what he made of those recent developments. Well, one of the thing that's, things that's come out of this is that Yevgeny Prigozhin now looks like the strongest guy in Russia. Remember, in a dictatorship like Putin's, the main way that the top guy stays in power is to look stronger and tougher than everybody else. He wants to look unassailable. What Prigozhin has done has really given the lie to the idea that Putin is fully in charge. Prigozhin went rogue months ago with his operation in Ukraine. He's actually been battling against um, army troops in Ukraine for some time now. But he's the guy who's been able to roll up some gains on the ground. And so Putin hasn't been able to abandon him. He's gotten stronger and stronger. He's putting out videos every day about his own exploits in the field, while the main army troops actually have, have managed to do very little. So he already was, a, was a, a kind of emerging in Russia as a kind of war hero, famous for his exploits in the field. Then he decides he's going to turn things around and invade Russia. Russia. Before he does that, he issues a, a video where he calls into question the entire narrative that Putin has told about the war and about the justification for the war. In that video, Prigozhin says that the whole story about East Ukrainians, that is, Russian speakers in East Ukraine being abused by the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian government being run by a bunch of Nazis, he says that's complete nonsense. He says NATO never threatened Russia in any way through Ukraine. Instead, he said the whole invasion was just about glorifying the Minister of Defense. The whole, the whole invasion of Ukraine was basically about just getting stuff for Putin's oligarchs to steal. So he completely undermines Putin's war narrative. That's sin number one. Then he invades Russia with his own troops. That's, of course, sin number two. And Putin can't stop him. He's greeted with open arms by people in Rostov, the major military city in the south. He takes over the military facility. That's the head of Southern Command in the Russian 
military, and then he rolls on to Moscow. But He's after only... all that, uh, Steve, after all that, I think one thing that people might be confused about is why go on this grand tirade, you know, call out things like corruption, uh, call out, you know, what he said about the war, as you've mentioned there, and then just turn around and say, that's OK, it's all over now. Well, he probably realized, Prigozhin probably realized that he wasn't going to be able to make it all the way to Moscow and take over Moscow. So he decided to cut his losses, stop along the way, and was able to negotiate an agreement with Putin, which actually let him off scot-free. This is a deal negotiated by, apparently, by the dictator of Belarus. And again, it made Prigozhin come off looking very strong. Putin had just given a grim-faced speech just hours before, claiming that the country was on the verge of chaos. He compared the situation to 1970. And then he turns around and basically pardons Prigozhin and lets him get out. This is the best possible situation for Prigozhin, and it makes him come off looking like the toughest guy in Russia. Oh, um, look, listening to some of the people who uh, 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 reporters were speaking to in Russia after this. Uh, I wonder how far that uh, narrative really goes because uh, one woman, for instance, told Reuters, it doesn't frighten me at all. I have confidence in our president and our people. Uh, president Lukashenko was one of the first people that President Putin spoke to after this crisis emerged. Uh, he is a close ally of President Putin. He has broken the deal. Could some of this come off or at least could Putin try to spin this as he took control of the situation, he solved the problem, so he doesn't come off looking weak at all. Of course he'll try to spin it this way, but one of the other people that you interviewed just in your previous report also said, look, Prigozhin has been treated by our government as this great hero for many months now, and now we're supposed to regard him as a villain. We thought he was the guy who was really taking charge and making some gains on the ground in Ukraine. Then Putin gives a speech saying, no, this awful guy is trying to take over our, our government and ruin our country. But then he cuts a deal with Prigozhin that basically drops charges against him and lets him go to Belarus. I can tell you, a lot of people in Russia now are, are wondering about how tough Putin really is and if he can main this, maintain the situation. What's more, Prigozhin was not stopped by the Russian military on the way into Moscow. He just stopped voluntarily, he probably realized he wasn't going to be able to make it all the way there. And he negotiated a, uh, a truce in which his troops basically will probably end up going back to Ukraine. He's going to go to Belarus for a while, but look, he's not going to stay there for long. I wouldn't be surprised to see, see him back in Ukraine or perhaps causing trouble somewhere else in the world very soon. So he comes out very looking like a winner. Okay, so you don't think that this relationship between uh, Prigozhin and Putin is over? I mean, what what is next for Prigozhin? You've hinted there that you don't think he'll stay in Belarus very long. And what happens to his troops who are still in Russia? Well, apparently they're supposed to be integrated into the main military. It's not clear that's actually going to happen. There's also the danger, and Putin knows this perfectly well, that even among Russia's regular military groups, they're looking to Prigozhin now as the guy who can get things done. They're looking to Prigozhin now as the guy who's actually standing up and telling the truth about the profiteering that's going on in this war, that's telling the truth about the fact that Putin is sending hundreds of thousands of men into this conflict, into this meat grinder, and doesn't really care about their fate. Prigozhin again comes off looking like the guy who cares about the troops, who's standing up for them. And Putin's very concerned that, in fact, that could infect the thinking of the entire military. Also, Prigozhin comes off in the Russian elite is looking like the one guy who could stand up to Putin. And remember, in a system like Putin's, if anybody's willing to stand up to the main man and can get away with it, then he really ends up looking like the biggest guy in, on, in town. And that's very bad for Putin. Professor Steve Fish there from the University of California, Berkeley. Well, as we've been hearing, Wagner's leader is on his way to Belarus. Here's Hanna Lubakova, journalist and researcher, on the role of the Belarusian president in the events yesterday. I think we should not exaggerate Lukashenko's role here. So first of all, both Minsk and Moscow keep saying that uh, he played a really significant role. Uh, but at the same time, he might have been uh, just a technical player here. He might have just served as a uh, sort of form of support after the uh, real negotiations took place between uh, the real actors, uh, who is Putin and Prigozhin. 
And we see the results of it. We see that Prigozhin is thought to be sent to Minsk, to Belarus. But the question is here, what role, who, 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 who Prigozhin, what Prigozhin is going to do in Minsk? What role he's going to play there? Is he going to stay in power, in charge of Wagner Group and so on? But I think most importantly here, what it shows to us is, is that Lukashenko plays the role of Putin's puppet and Belarus became like a backyard for Russia. Journalist Hannah Lubakova there. Well, the response from other countries to these dramatic events in Russia was cautious. NATO said they were also watching uh, developments closely and the leaders of the US, France, Germany and the UK held a call to discuss the situation in which they reaffirmed their support for Ukraine. Let's go live now to Simon Jones, who's outside the Foreign Office in Westminster. Uh, Simon, what's the political reaction been here? Well, I think this morning here at the Foreign Office, people are really pausing for a moment's breath after what was an extraordinary 24 hours in Russia. I think there was some surprise here at the speed at which this insurgency broke out and then the speed which that ultimately then led to a retreat. There was real concern given the fact that Russia is, of course, a nuclear power. So the prospect of any sort of civil war breaking out within Russia was extremely unpalatable. The official line this morning coming from the Foreign Office here in London is that they are continuing to monitor the situation closely in Russia. We know that yesterday the British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly held a meeting of the government's emergency committee known as COBRA as well as analysing the situation on the ground in Russia. A key priority was the safety of British citizens who live within the country. Now the advice remains here that British citizens should not travel to Russia. James Cleverly also held talks with other G7 leaders and the British Prime Minister was also involved in the analysis. We know that Rishi Sunak spoke to the US President, to the French President and also the German Chancellor. And one key message emerging from those meetings was the ongoing support of the Western alliance towards Ukraine and the people of Ukraine who have been in effect by the Russian invasion. Now, in terms of what happens next, I think officials here will be watching very closely because what we do know is in the past when President Putin has seen his authority challenged, some are saying he was humiliated by what happened yesterday, he does have a tendency to lash out. So there will be some concern in places like the Foreign Office here and in other parts of the world that the Russian leader could seek to exact some sort of revenge on Ukraine, upping military activity there. But given the withdrawal of the Wagner Group and its upcoming idea of disbanding it, it's unclear how much really the Russian leader will have the power and authority to increase any sort of attacks on Ukraine. So very much a monitoring situation here. As you say, world leaders not so keen to get directly involved to speak out given the situation of what was happening in Russia and the lack of clarity on it. But I think we're expecting to hear more from British politicians during the course of today. All right, Simon, thank you very much. Simon Jones there with The View from the UK. And following events from the US and how the White House reacted, here's CBS News foreign affairs correspondent Christina Ruffini. Well, the U.S. is watching this very closely. President Biden was at the White House this morning and had what is essentially an all-hands meeting. National Security Advisor, CIA Director, Secretary of State, where they all sat and talked about this and tried to figure out essentially what was happening because, as you know, the, the news and the information was dripping out very slowly. Now, President Biden has since gone on to Camp David for the weekend, but he's taken his National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, with him. Sullivan was supposed to be overseas in Copenhagen for a conference, ironically, on Ukraine, but he's staying close to the president as officials watch this unfold. Now, as you mentioned, congressional leaders, according to my CBS colleagues, have been briefed multiple times in the past in the past days about the danger posed by the Wagner Group. But it's unclear at this point what exactly that danger was. And if the U.S. intelligence knew that this specific, uh, you know, incident could play out, if this was the risk posed, you know, the Wagner Group has its fingers in many regions and many conflicts around the world. They've been a known quantity for a while, the U.S. officials. Um, but but, you know, as as 
as officials and former officials and diplomats all over the world kind of reacted to this today, I heard a lot of expletives or, and then got texted off the record a lot of expletives as everyone was trying to figure out what the blank was going on. So I think as events try to calm down a little bit, we'll see a little bit more of a regroup and some statements. But for the moment, the statements we've seen have mainly been the president, the secretary of state, the defense officials reaching out to their counterparts in Europe, reaching out to their allies as everybody kind of tries to get on the same page and, and watch essentially what, it, what unfolded today overseas. Previously, until the what the Russians call their special operations, operation in Ukraine, the U.S. goal for Russian policy had been essentially to put guardrails on the relationship. And as one former official told me today, the war in Ukraine basically drew a, grew, uh, drove a big armored tank through those guardrails, and they no longer exist. So the U.S. has been trying to manage this relationship, and I think it's a wait-and-see kind of situation. Officials are all kind to step back. I think the instincts, a lot of people have said, well, this has to be good for the U.S., right? Anything that's bad for Putin is good for the U.S. That's not necessarily the case. President Biden may not be a huge fan of President Putin, but the bigger fear is Russia is a major nuclear weapons holder, and the U.S. does not want those nuclear weapons falling into the hands of an unpredictable actor or even for the Kremlin to lose command and control. So that's something officials here in Europe and around the world are very concerned about as they watch this play out inside Russia. CBS correspondent Christina Ruffini there. So in just over a day, events escalated and then de-escalated quickly. Let's take a look back at what happened. On Friday, the Wagner boss launched a rant, blaming the Russian defense minister for the war in Ukraine and called for a march for justice. He then also called for an armed rebellion and security was stepped up across Russia, including the capital, Moscow. Prigozhin declared that 25,000 of his troops crossed into Russia from Ukraine and then took control of a military building in Rostov, near the Ukrainian border. As security continued to be tightened in Moscow, President Putin issued a statement on television denouncing what he called the criminal adventure and warned of punishment. Over the course of the day, Wagner forces made their way up the M4 motorway from Rostov towards Moscow, seizing military facilities in Voronezh along the way. But then, in the early evening in Russia, Prigozhin told his troops to stop. Later, it was revealed that a deal had been reached between the Wagner chief and Putin, with Prigozhin heading to Belarus and that he would face no criminal charges. So that's what's happened so far. Let's go live now to our Eastern Europe correspondent, Sarah Rainsford, who's been following events from Warsaw. Uh, Sarah, this uh, took a really surprising turn yesterday uh, when we heard that Prigozhin had abandoned his mission and was heading instead to Belarus. Uh, what are we waking up to today? Well, we're still waking up to a lot of questions about what exactly happened. You know, an extraordinary day from start to finish. The the, the fact of what was happening, the, the attempt to challenge Vladimir Putin's authority, really undermine him, frankly. Uh, and then the, the very rapid conclusion of that and the announcement that Yevgeny Prigozhin had essentially given up and gone home and that he was actually being exiled to Belarus. So we don't know where he is now. We saw pictures of him leaving uh, Rostov yesterday. Uh, we saw actually cheering crowds sending him off. We saw even people uh, taking selfies with Yevgeny Prigozhin as some kind of, of hero, despite the fact this was a man, of course, who had been uh, labelled a traitor to his country earlier in the day by Vladimir Putin. But even that, the charge of betrayal, the charge of treason ha has dropped away because as part of this deal that was done behind the scenes, uh, negotiated by the authoritarian leader of Belarus, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, as part of that deal, the criminal charge against Yevgeny Prigozhin and against his Wagner group have actually been dropped. And that in itself is really extraordinary because Vladimir Putin hates betrayal. He values loyalty and trust. And he had spoken out very strongly saying that this was a stab in the back uh, of Russia. And the fact that he has then moved on to do a deal which allowed all criminal charges to be dropped uh, is really quite something. You know, I think there's a big question to see what happens going forward. Where will Yevgeny Prigozhin end up? What will he do? Uh, and will he actually uh, survive politically, militarily indeed, a, as a figure into the future? Those are a, a big questions as well as many more about what happened yesterday. Certainly interesting questions to consider. Only time will tell for some of 
them. Uh, for now, though, what do we know about how uh, the events of the past few days have uh, left President Putin? Uh, obviously, this was a, a real challenge to the perception of his boundless power. Uh, how is he being perceived now? Well, I think that's true. I think, you know, this has dented his authority. Uh, whatever the deal that has been reached, however quickly this crisis was apparently averted, uh, it has left Vladimir Putin with a big dent, a big chip uh, in his supposedly all-powerful aura, his all-powerful image. Because this is a man, of course, who has presented himself as the man who, who, present, who represents stability, who represents order and control. And he didn't look like that at all yesterday. And in fact, you know, the, 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 the fact that this crisis was, was able to, to reach this point is also down to Vladimir Putin because the feud between Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Wagner Group and the Defence Ministry has been played out in public for a very long time and nobody intervened. Vladimir Putin perhaps owes Yevgeny Prigozhin way too much uh, for all of the, the things the, that he's been doing on his behalf around the world for so many years to nip this in the bud. He failed to act and that came home and essentially bit him. He had Yevgeny Prigozhin, a creature of his creation, uh, challenging his power. And I think that was unacceptable for Vladimir Putin, but the fact that it happened at all has certainly dented his authority. And do we know what the impact is or could be on the Russian military? Obviously, there were uh, those two generals that Prigozhin uh, specifically targeted. Do we know what's happening with them? Well, I mean, not just any generals. This is the defense minister himself, Sergei Shoigu. It is the chief of staff, Valery Gerasimov. These are the two figures uh, that Yevgeny Prigozhin had been demanding be removed from their jobs. He's been demanding that for a long time, but of course not in quite such a dramatic fashion. Now, the Kremlin, when asked about that yesterday, said uh, that nothing had changed in terms of their status. But let's see what happens in the midterm. I don't expect Vladimir Putin to turn around and sack them because that would also look weak. Perhaps their position in the, in the medium to long term might uh, be compromised. It, it's hard to tell. What exactly uh, did Yevgeny Prigozhin get uh, as a result of the deal, the compromise that was brokered in Belarus? We just don't know. I mean, it looks at the moment that he's gone into exile, uh, claiming that he was wanting to avoid bloodshed uh, and that it's all over. But perhaps it's not. We, we're, we're not entirely clear yet how exactly this is going to play out. So many questions around this. Sarah Rainsford, thank you very much. Uh, for joining us to discuss some of them. Well, in Kiev, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the Wagner mutiny was a clear sign of weakness in the Kremlin. And with more on the ongoing counteroffensive, here's General Douglas Lute, former U.S. permanent representative to NATO. This move over the last 24 hours, exposing weakness in, in the Kremlin, uh, placing at risk the operational headquarters in Rostov, uh, diverting the attention of Russian soldiers and probably decreasing the morale of Russian frontline soldiers presents a huge opportunity for the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now is the time uh, to strike while, Ukraine, while Russia's attention is divided uh, and while Russia has to look not only to the West, to the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive, but now increasingly to the East uh, and wondering uh, about the loyalties of forces in Russia itself. I think Prigozhin and the Wagner Group will be cut down to size. I don't, I don't buy this recent explanation that uh, Lukashenko and Belarus uh, mediated some sort of deal uh, that will diffuse the situation and everything will be okay tomorrow. Uh, I think in the coming days, you're gonna see um, a, a harsh form of Putin justice uh, brought to Prigozhin and, his, and the leadership of the Wagner Group. Uh, this will not be forgiven and forgotten. Douglas Lute is former U.S. permanent representative to NATO. Well, don't forget, for more information on everything happening in Russia, you can head to the BBC News website and app where our team is tracking every single development with full background, analysis and the latest BBC reporting. I'm Nancy Kachingira. Stay with us on BBC News. I have a personal stylist, and you can too. Stitch Fix makes it easy. I share my style, size, and budget, and my stylist does the shopping for me. She sends me the most amazing pieces. I keep what I love and send back the rest. Stitch Fix. The BetterHelp platform brings 
counseling two people and brings me to people where they are. It really makes a difference when people can actually settle down and feel that they're having a conversation with you rather than they are getting analyzed. I've had sessions where I work with clients primarily by way of text and kind of live chat with them, as well as messages back and forth. You get the therapy in the way that it is most convenient and comfortable to you. Why is Aaron happy? Well, Carvana has tens of thousands of cars under $20,000. So Aaron's folks could help hook him up with a new ride. We'll drive you happy at Carvana. Be thankful for the little moments, like a radiant color palette, the hypnotizing swirl of a recipe coming together. All that's left is to savor it. Go to HelloFresh.com slash TV16 for 16 free meals plus the first box ships free. If you have employees, you need to check out the ERC program, Chef Wonderful. Why, Mr. Wonderful? Because it's cash flow that you don't have to pay back. Good to know. This guy's so smart and so handsome. Go to Wondertrust.com to see if you're eligible. You're a raver. Do I look like a raver? <laughs> I've got bass in a backpack. This is amazing. Dancing for like four or five hours of a gig, you could generate about 800 kilowatt hours of thermal energy. Right, so shall we give it a taste? And it's my favorite. We're really talking to the plants, and they're telling us how happy they are. It can fly, but it can also float on water. Oh my god, that came by quick. It's all about augmented reality. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. Totally and utterly immersed in another world there. Your tech update. Click on BBC News. A lot of people that know me still don't know that I'm a gambling addict. Even when I came here, um, I just said I was going to like a mental health facility because everyone knew that I had, you know, mental health episodes that were bad, but no one knew that I was an addict. Well, I'd kept my gambling a secret for years, um, and obviously it did eventually all come out. These British women fought to keep their gambling addiction a secret until they were offered a lifeline a place in a residential centre and a chance to confront their addiction. I can't remember the exact amount, but I, it shocked my parents. It shocked my partner at the time, because I think it worked out to be like £30,000 in the space of three months. Recent studies indicate that around the world, the number of women gambling is growing. And for those with addiction, it's often done in secret. We seem to be sleepwalking, it feels like, towards a problem. This is BBC News, the headlines. Cheering crowds watched the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, leave the Russian city of Rostov for Belarus. It was only hours after he called off his rebellion against the Russian military. The Kremlin says he will not face any criminal charges. Wagner fighters have left the southern city of Rostov as well, where they took control early Saturday. The mercenaries have been told they will not be prosecuted and will be allowed to join the Russian army. There have been reports of an explosion overnight near the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. It is the site of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. The Ukrainian army has launched a counter-offensive in the area, and that's to try to take back the territory that the Russians captured last year. Global business news from the boardroom or grassroots. Aaron Hesselhurst cuts through the jargon to add colour, depth and context. With live reaction from Wall Street and Asia, studio interviews with top CEOs and the latest innovations in technology. Talking business on BBC News.
Talking Business is sponsored by Romini Street.